from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening. I'm Ann McLean. I'd like to welcome all of you on behalf of the Library of Congress Concert Office and also the Poetry and Literature Center. Tonight we're delighted to be presenting the world premiere performance of a work by Michael Hirsch performed by members of the Atos Trio. Titled Carry On Miles to Purgatory, 13 Pieces After Texts of Robert Lowell, his composition for violin and piano, sorry, violin and cello is a commission from the library's Hans Kindler Foundation Trust Fund. We're very pleased to have Michael with us tonight and fortunate to be able to present him as a speaker in conversation with psychologist and author Kay Redfield Jameson. This premiere is an important feature in our rich and very diverse 2015-16 lineup, a wonderful season that celebrates our 90 years as a vibrant concert presenter on the world stage. For the music division, it's a great pleasure to see this commission come into being. Michael Hirsch is internationally admired as a distinguished and thoughtful composer and pianist. And in our program tonight, you can read several comments um, about his career. And there are a wealth of statements that you can find online and in the literature by critics and commentators that attest to his stature. The Financial Times of London states that he's considered, quote, one of the most fertile and musical minds to emerge in the U.S. over the past generation. And the Baltimore Sun talks about music of, quote, stark, unsettling, seemingly implausible beauty. I won't mention the prizes and awards, but you can see them in tonight's program, and it's an impressive list. I would also like to acknowledge three guests that we are very delighted to welcome this evening. Dr. Ronald Daniels, president of Johns Hopkins University, and his wife, Joanne Rosen, and Dean Frederick Bronstein from Pret Peabody Conservatory. It's unusual to find a leading research institution of global repute with the rare attribute of being home to one of the world's leading conservatories. Tonight's pre-concert presentation definitely points up the commitment of these institutions to a philosophy of creative and provocative interdisciplinary ventures. In a specially resonant confluence for our own institution, Dr. Jameson and Michael Hirsch will be talking about the work of Robert Lowell, who was the library's poet laureate consultant in poetry in 1947 and 1948. Kay Jameson is the Dalio Family Professor in Mood Disorders, Professor of Psychiatry at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, and co-director of the Johns Hopkins Mood Disorder Center. She's an acknowledged international authority on depressive illnesses. Also, she has a good friend to the Library of Congress, convening in 2008 a very successful Music in the Brain speaker series, which is still very much in circulation online. Dr. Jameson is also a Robert Lowell scholar and will shortly be publishing a book about the poet. Afterwards, she will be look in the lobby. You can greet her, and I wanted to say that we are we have for sale copies of her book, Touched with Fire, Manic Depressive Illness, and the Artistic Temperament. Please welcome Kay Redfield Jameson. Thank you. It's wonderful to be back at the Library of Congress. Great, great place. And an honor to be on the same platform as Michael Hirsch. Robert Lowell was born into a prominent New England family in 1917. He was a poet of great originality and huge influence in American poetry and uh, Western poetry in general. He was twice awarded the Pulitzer Prize for poetry. And as Anne said, in 1947 and 1948, he was the consultant in poetry here at the Library of Congress. That was the early title for Poet Laureate of the United States. Lowell suffered throughout his life from manic depressive or bipolar illness, from a particularly terrible form of it, and was hospitalized for mania nearly 20 times. He died in 1977 at the age of 60. So I'm going to talk just uh, for a little while, for a few minutes, about Robert Lowell and his poetry, and then a little bit about 
some of the um, overlap and similarities between Robert Lowell and uh, Michael Hirsch, not the mental illness side of things, but the, <laughs> the genius side of things. And then Michael and I are going to talk not so long because we'd like to leave it open for a lot of questions. Dark, darkness honestly lived through is a place of wonder in life, Robert Lowell wrote. So much has come from there. It was October 1957, and he was 40 years old, writing poetry like a house of fire and taking darkness into a new country. It was, he said, the best writing he had ever done. His new work became the heart of life studies, described by one critic as the most influential book of poetry since T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. The poems, most written at the Boyle and in a few months' time, left their mark. They have made a conquest, wrote a reviewer. They have won a major expansion of the territory of poetry. In December 1957, after his summer and fall blaze of writing, Lola was admitted to a psychiatric hospital in Boston. He was psychotic, manic, insane. It was his fifth psychiatric hospitalization in eight years. These were long hospitalizations, not like our modern hospitalizations where uh, people get admitted and leave almost as soon as they get admitted. Uh, these were hospitalizations of many months. These were very severe manias where he would be put in a straitjacket, uh, taken to the hospital by six or seven Boston police officers. Lowell told the doctor who admitted him that the preceding months had been some of the most productive months of his writing poetry. It was a pattern he had come to know well. First, the weeks of intense, fiery writing, then the spike into mania, and finally, as night follows day, the dust in the blood of depression. The psychiatrist wrote in Lowell's medical chart what many of his doctors were to observe. Quote, the patient has had a series of breaks, she wrote, all in light of unusual literary output. Much had come from the darkness, but not without a cost. Mania and imagination may at times come together to help create great art, but discipline and character make art from inborn gift. Poetry may come from an unhappy and disordered life, Lowell once wrote, but a huge amount of health has to go into the misery. Without question, Lowell's attacks of mania spurred some of his finest works. They also brought great pain to him and to those he loved. Things he had done when he was manic haunted him when he was well. He was mortified and ashamed. So too did his terror that he would become psychotic again. Yet Lowell came back from madness time and time and time again, re-entered the fray, and kept intact his friendships. He kept his wit, he kept his capacity to love, he went back to work. This faculty for regeneration is not a common one, nor is the courage to face and to write from the certainty of impending madness. Courage is unusual. So too is creating poetry that expands the territory. Lowell's poetic imagination was tethered to an unstable but fiercely disciplined mind. It forged his work and it branded his life. When I'm dead, Lowell once told a friend, I don't care what you write about me. All I ask is that it be serious. Lowell's seriousness of purpose was matched by a vaulting ambition that had been his since childhood. It was a desire and a capacity for vastness Ambition, the great sweep of great ideas. It was something he admired in other writers. Melville and Hawthorne, whom he loved, Lowell once wrote, pour out more than the measure will hold. What wonderful dangers, errors, condescensions, and breathless abundance. Lowell, Hawthorne, Melville, Whit Whitman, all, like Coleridge, were habituated to the vast. They swung for the fences. They wrote to change the game. Many of Lowell's early poems, including several of those chosen as texts for this evening's music, 
by Michael Hirsch, are dominated by themes of moral decay, of pain, suffering, of fallen New England, retribution, and the unforgiving Puritanism of his ancestors. He wrote of the complex burden of heritage and of the dark, ambiguous grace of God. The battle that raged between Calvinism, his native tongue, the New England Protestantism that he had known longest and breathed most deeply, and the Catholicism that he had as an adult taken to heart and mind and then quit, was one that was reflected in part in his mental wars. It was a clash that entered into his work violently and unforgettably in his early poems, work that the most influential critic of the time said would be read as long as men remember English. These are, were poems of ambition, elegy, and blood, coiled and unstable in force and fury, and crafted with brilliance. Lowell's great poem, The Quaker Graveyard in Nantucket, which Michael Hirsch has drawn from this evening, um, in part, owes a debt to Melville and the Old Testament, to Thoreau, to Hopkins. It is Homeric in force, mythic in scale, and spelled by the violence of God in Lowell's home North Atlantic waters. It is the battleground for the contrasting forces that defined his mind as a young poet. The poem, as Seamus Heaney said, is one where the percussion and brass section of the language orchestra is driven hard and the string section hardly gets a look in. Michael Hirsch has essential things in common with Robert Lowell. He is an unrelentingly serious artist. His work is rooted in a profound knowledge of grief and death and life of the human condition in art, literature, and in music. He has, like Lowell, a restless tectonic imagination and the courage of his beliefs. He takes risks. Lowell, it is always said, and as somebody who's writing about, a book about him, it is the first thing, if anybody's actually heard of Lowell, the first thing they, people say is, he's a really difficult poet. Lowell is a difficult poet. It's part of what makes him great. So too is Michael a difficult composer. His work is complex, unpredictable, dark, and wonderful. It is beautiful. It is piercingly human. And I am honored to be here with him tonight. So he's just, we're going to just keep this very informal. Okay. Uh, so, why the whole? Um. <clears throat> You know, when I've always been drawn, especially since uh, I got out of school, I tend to find much more um, inspiration, more of friendship, if you will, in, and camaraderie and company in text, whether it's literary uh, or poetical. And there's very little of that, that, that jumps out and sort of grabs hold of me in the sense that I feel like, in that way that I think what all artists are looking for on some level, where you, you, we react very strongly to when we see something of ourselves somewhere else. And, um, and I, don't, I don't make any uh, presuppositions or suppositions about what Lowell meant, felt, any of these things. But it doesn't change the fact that in a lot of his work, I saw something of myself. And again, I understand that it's a, it's a one to zero correspondence. It's just, it's, it's all uh, in, in my own mind, in my own sensibility or sensitivity. Um, but when I you know, started combing through his work, it's, sometimes it's just a word. Uh, you know, it's often not more than a word or a pair of words or a trio, quartet of words, or maybe a phrase. Very, very rarely will it be an entire uh, tract of poetry, um, but these are the things that sort of ignite something in me. Um, it's incredibly exciting to feel like that there's someone who, who 
saw the world through similar eyes, even though the experiences couldn't, couldn't be different. And in a way, it doesn't really matter to me what, what it is that he saw. It's, it's how I perceive it on the page. What's real is what's in front of me, not an abstract biography. That, um, and so, yeah. And so like all the art and literature and poetry and music that I respond to, there was something there that just sort of cuts to the marrow of what it is that I'm, that I'm looking for in, in, in art. And then it has some, and then it in turn has an impact in one way or another on, on, on things that I attempt to make myself. So of, of all of his poetry, which is huge in that collected verse uh, of his, you focused on the early poems. Um, was that because they, it was such a long <laughs> collection of poetry to get through, or was it no, that I, you were drawn I, to the early? I think I think that there there was there was something uh, actually you know what I do, and you know if if you go through uh, and no one no one will I'm sure, but if anybody ever went through all of my my books, um, you might go th you might take a book off the shelf that contains some of the most consequential material in terms of material that I've somehow uh, had a conversation with, uh, you know, in terms of literature or poetry through music. Um, but oftentimes, if someone looked at one of those books, they would, wouldn't notice anything in it. They'd have to look very carefully because there'd be, you know, two words on this page, and then 60 pages later, there might be a, a sentence here, and then another 45 pages later, something else. It's, it's incredibly specific to me, and there's oftentimes no real method or obvious methodology <clears throat> to, to how I'm engaging with these texts. So that was really notable in Lowell's case that, that the terrain of the, of, the, of the expression that I was feeling myself, sort of, again, looking for companionship, and certain, certain text fragments came to mind. So when I was writing this music, I started the music before <clears throat> I went to the Lowell, but certain text fragments of Lowell came to, to mind, you know. Um, I remember one of the first ones, was, there's was a line in a poem, it just is something as simple as uh, the canaries beat their bars and scream. And, I, and that just came, it, it just sort of popped into my mind. Um, or another, another image of two angels fighting over the soul of a man with bill hooks. You know, these kinds of images that were just incredibly, how, they're just sort of searing images. And I would just be writing, and then they would come to mind. And then I would go and then try to track down, where did I remember that from? Where did I, um, you know, and some of them, and then sometimes there'd be musical, musical allusions, you know, that he would talk, there's, um, line where he talks about hell being burned out <clears throat> and heaven's harp strings going slack, you know. And then, but somehow these all start to, to tie together, to tether together, and ultimately it makes sense. They were from the same collection. But that surprised me, because usually people are trying to make sense of what the relationships are between different text fragments. But in this case, there was a, it was very clean that way. But that just speaks to his own uh, sort of the consistency of his, his uh, the rendering of his own imagination at that at that time. Right, and I think one of the things that's very clear and fascinating about Lowell is he's one of these writers, rather like Beethoven, who just moved from epic. I mean, he just moved and changed and went on and recreated, mm -hmm. and so that Lord Worry's <laughs> Castle, which is the basis of, of most of your fragments is completely different from right. so much of, of his uh, of the work that he did right. after that. So very, very different. And yeah, yeah. And so, and yeah, and, and, and there's no, you know, there's no real explanation as to, I mean, you know, the, the, the interesting thing, or maybe it's not so interesting, is that I'm not... I'm not looking for something, I'm looking for something that is trying to capture a sort of a emotional or psychological, there's, there's some, something that, that's going to click with a feeling, but that feeling, I'm not after an image. I mean, I think that that's one of the 
complicating factors in you know, a piece like this. And I'm certainly not the first person to engage with, with text this way. But a lot of times people want to, they, they like the, the, it's a very clean idea to take a, an image that's laid out in words that we all understand and then the idea of, okay, then a composer taking that and trying to <clears throat> render that or transform that into sound. <clears throat> that's too facile. I don't know if that's the right use of the word. It's not, it's, it's more nuanced than that. <clears throat> and it's the, it's, these images are a byproduct of, of, of something that's, you know, it's a, a feeling, it's a, a state of mind, a state of being. Um, and I think one of the things that's extraordinary about Lowell is he's able to take something as simple as an image, though, and capture that. Most people, that's, that's a very hard thing to do. And so I found, for me, what was different about these texts versus others is how visual they are, or to me, yes. how visual they are. Well, right. He described ex you know, capturing experience in tongs, mm -hmm. you know, and that you, you would look at them. And I think that one of his famous images was uh, meat hooked from, uh, words meat hooked from the living steer. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's that incredibly graphic imagery yeah. that, you know, you have to have a heart of stone to remain unresponsive to, I think. Yeah, yeah, no. I, yeah. Do you see anything in, in, in kind of intrinsically musical about Lowell's work? I mean, uh, by definition, poetry is musical, but is there anything that sets him apart or not? Um, you know, well, for me, what's interesting is most of the a lot most of the texts that I've ended up connecting really strong, strongly with over my my life, they tend to be texts written in non English languages, and they're translated. And sometimes I can handle the original languages, but in the end, I'm I'm a product of English, and um, I have just the most you know, just the admiration I have and the gratitude I have for great translators is, um, you know, is, can't be overstated. Of course, Lowell translated as well. So what was interesting was, along with just a few other people, here was someone writing in English. So there's something inherently musical to me about seeing these feelings, these thoughts, these feelings, these, you know, these recollections, these terrors, these premonitions, whatever whatever they, you might call them, in English and originally conceived in English. And there's something just, because that's my language, it's the language I'm most comfortable in, there's something inherently musical to me. It's, it's not ex answering your question exactly, but, but yes, I do find there's something particularly musical about these words and the way that they are laid out on the page. Um, but of course, in this case, you know, I'm not setting any of these mm -hmm. words. Right. You know. um, I was telling someone earlier that I think probably, you know, I've written a lot of music that has, that's, that has relationships with text in one way or another, just like this piece, that it, it accompanies the piece in a certain way, but it's not, it's, it's a communication more between me and uh, the writer. But I think this piece, more than any other that I've done, I do feel it's, if not necessary, important for people to read the, when they're listening to the music, to read the accompanying text. Um, again, in the past, I would not have, I would have felt that they are not, you know, the text certainly don't need my music, and I would hope that the music doesn't need any text that may have, you know, accompanied me personally on, on a journey of writing. But in this case, I think that they are, they're, they're unified in a way that's much more pronounced and, <coughs> So uh, in this case, I, I encourage people to, to read and listen. Yeah. And I think that uh, Lord Ray's castle is just so marked by movement and energy and force and madness, but it just, it moves. I mean, there's something, there's a velocity mm -hmm. to Lord Ray's castle that is strikingly, it's not unlike his, subsequent work, but it's just much, much more pronounced. Yeah, I would agree. There's, a, there's, a, there's an immediacy to it that it sort of compels itself forward. I would even say even within small fragments, it, it does that. And I think um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think f for me in, in all art, whether it's a, you know, a, a building, a sculpture, a painting, a poem, a novel, something for me that's important is a sense of momentum. But you can achieve momentum in absolute stasis and never have anything other than absolute stasis, and there still can be a, a, a shocking momentum to it. Uh, and I think that, that he, he achieves that. He definitely achieves that kind of momentum in whatever he's, he's doing when he's at his best. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's true. And I think that one of the things that is, is striking in his work is this, this change over time but that incredible just rhythm, um, particularly in the early works. I mean, it's just, it's just this powerful, it's, it's the sea over and mm. over again, uh, or it's the turmoil in people over and over again, but it's in waves and, and yeah. unremitting. And one thing I, I thought was interesting was, it was when, when I realized how relatively young he was when he wrote those, I felt as I was becoming very, not relatively young anymore. Um, it, it, it always it just struck me as, as a bit odd that I would be, that I was drawn to, to these, you know, in light of where he was in his life and, and you know, and where he, that period in all of our lives is, you know, whatever's happening is always a bit tempestuous and, um, you know, and, and on some level, uh, I, I, I was I was cur I was puzzled by this, but what's interesting though is I think that that in the, for me it 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 for him that was his life at the time, and for me life for all of us you know as we get older it becomes defined more and more by events you know and and actions and you know things that have boundaries and sometimes those boundaries become unclear or broken and they spill, but but. It was interesting how something that very clearly for him was sort of all-encompassing and, you know, sort of his state of mind over a period of years, you know, applied so nicely to something where I was in a state of mind, you know, put into a state of mind of something very specific that, you know, sort of does recapture those sort of the sort of generic trauma of, of, of being younger, but in this case, real traumas. Um, and just how nicely it was able to, I was able to take something that on the surface didn't seem to mesh so much with where I was in my life, but then taken and put inside, encapsulated in a series of events in my life that actually that worked really nicely. I mean, I'm only thinking about this right now. I haven't actually thought too much about that. But um, so in that sense, the period in his life is not, is not really relevant. I mean, Many artists have done a lot of great things, and uh, at that period, it's not such an extraordinary age to do to do good work. But there's a there's a, a totality to his state of mind, is an all encompassingness to that state of mind that he's able to then sort of sustain without it seeming like he's able to avoid you know, the traps of I think of a lot of people you know when, when we're younger of falling into self-pity or just kind of, you know, just sort of a sort of undefined angst, you know, and, um, and, it, and it, it just translates so nicely to sort of real world grown up things that are, again, that are sort of defined events. And, um, and in that sense, it's that, that maturity level of it is quite extraordinary, I think. Gee, can you write a chapter for my book? <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> That's very true. Um, and, I, and I think, too, with Lowell, as you say, I mean, he was 29 when he um, got the Pulitzer Prize for this body of work. And by that time, he had been through just an incredible series of lifetimes. I mean, I think that partly he was born tempestuous, and he sort of died tempestuous, but th this was a period of time that was just striking for the, the changes in, in his emotional um, being. And, and then in just a few years' time, then he would be hospitalized for the first time for mania. But the, you could feel the mania in, in the works, yeah. I mean, and certainly in, in, the, in the violence of the works. And I, I think what's also interesting about it is, is that not unlike many people, of course, he had a great love for music. And he wrote about music. So he wrote about a sonnet about the trout. He wrote a sonnet about uh, the Archduke trio that's being played tonight. 
He wrote sonnets about Beethoven, Schubert, and uh, the two great composers that he, he most loved. But so there was something always in the back of his mind. You just you had the sense of was being informed by music, his being a classicist by education and training and heart, uh, by other poets, by other writers, by love. I mean, just this hugely broad, and not this kind of picayune, manicured life that. Right. He, you know, he yeah. seemed he looked around him, you know, and you had that that sense, you know, and. And you know, and it's. I mean, the. I mean, I remember for me, you know, it. You know, I feel like when all the early years that I was composing, certainly through my, you know, late teens and and twenties, you know, it wasn't. I didn't sort of feel like I had my head above the clouds, uh, you know, until I got into my, you know, on the far side of twenty-five. You know, I mean, I just feel like that I, there was just so much I just wasn't seeing, and so. Um, you know, and that, that just takes, you know, for me, it, it took some time. It took me, and so, so to read something, you know, that, that where someone had a sort of a control of his materials um, and had a sense of what was around him, I don't mean sense of influences or things, I mean just a sense of the human landscape that surrounded him. Um, you know, I, I feel like I'm still, I'm still, you know, Noticing thing, you know, and all of us, you know, we're going to notice things hopefully always. Um, but what was interesting, you know, just looking back at it from that perspective, to be able to see someone who had figured that out, or, and there was a clarity of thought, you know, at a relatively young, you know, when I was sure that I had that clarity of thought then, but then, you know, and it's interesting, and a lot of times you'll, I've found, you know, that, that writers and poets have that clarity of thought before uh, musicians. Just, I don't know why that may be. Um, and I don't know if I have any clarity of thought yet, but there's a the sense of oneself changes, and you know, um, and a sense of being in the dark a bit. But he, he just there's a sort of omniscience to, his, you know, that comes through, whether it was real or not. It, it, there's a sort of force of personality also, and I think that's also one of the things that characterizes him. There's just a, an absolute this, this, the force of, the, of his personality just comes through very strongly from very early on. Um, you know, and that's a rare thing. You see, he once uh, quoted uh, about John Berryman, who was similarly forceful and manic, um, that there was no one so loyal as John, but you like to have him live in another city. And uh, <laughs> there is that element of, of just pure intensity, but I, I think it's also true that people who knew him very well and who loved him very much also describe this incredible gentleness. So there's this, always these opposing sort of forces of uh, just incredible gentleness and kindness and thoughtfulness and soft-spokenness. Um, he's a complicated man. Yeah. Yeah. So wh 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 what about the writing of it and the, the words and, and, and the music and then maybe open it up to questions? Yeah. No, I mean, there's really not not much to say. I mean, the the uh, the piece, you know, uh, you, know you can read in in the notes that were um, that everybody has. But it's in 13 movements, and it wasn't. And the piece just sort of unfolds. It's its own, you know. It it you know. I don't want. I, I don't. It, it is what it sort of needs to be, which, you know, which was, you know, and I may, you know, end up revising it a lot in the coming weeks, but, you know, I mean, I just, you know, this particular piece was, um, you know, I, uh, you know, writing for a violin and cello is, is, I found difficult, but, you know, it was a real sort of metal testing. It was, there, there are two instruments I feel very close to, um, but I'd never written just for the two of them together, and so, there was a lot of, it was, the, the Lowell's text provided some of these, these landscapes that he provided, you know, sort of in my own mind, create certain sonorities, there's certain sounds that, um, but you know, all the kinds of things that go into writing it, it's sort of like, you know, um, I don't know how, how important it is for, for people to really know. It's sort of like, you know, looking at the, you know, the wiring or the, Piping of a building, you know, it's it's you know well, the piece, the piece. Maybe a little bit more interesting. <laughs> no, 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 the, 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 but it, you know, it it. I'll just reiterate what I said before that that more than any other piece that I've written that's engaged with, 
text that where the text is not sung, that it is it's essential to it's essential to this piece. This piece wouldn't have been written had I not been engaging with these with these texts. And and as I said before, the fact that so many of them just sort of came to mind in a involuntary sort of way um, speaks to how important they were to me or have been without maybe even me knowing it. Um, so you know, even on some level, it, it, it might even be OK to, to refer to this set of pieces as a kind of songs without words kind of thing, except for the words are there. They're just not, they're just not <laughs> sung. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Just open it up for questions. Yes. What prompted this particular choice? That was just simply the when the when the library approached me, they they wanted something that had, that featured the cello. So the normal thing would probably be to do a sonata, you know, with piano or maybe a solo cello. But but after thinking about it, I had to think about it for a while. And this is this. And if if I hadn't, you know, even with this incredibly generous, uh, you know, opportunity, exciting opportunity, I still needed to feel. Um, I have to feel excited about if I'm going to undertake uh, any kind of project. Um, at a bare minimum, I have to be excited about the possibility of writing for whatever the the medium is. And so I, I went to them and I said, I, it would be a bit unorthodox, but perhaps, but. Would they allow me to write something for violin and cello? So they said yes. So that's all. Yes. Um, huh? When did Lowell die out again? Oh, she wants to die. Oh, how he died. He, uh, this is the composer's daughter, Abby. <laughs> Abby Hirsch. <laughs> Delighted you're here. Um, uh, Mr. Lowell died of. Um, a, a lot of things, but uh, I would actually turn to my husband, who's a cardiologist, and who's doing that side of the, the work, but he died of? He died of a heart attack. Yes. In a taxi cab. But after years of four or five packs a day of cigarettes, uh, not inconsiderable amount of drinking, uh, and mania, which puts you actually much elevated rate for heart disease. So he, he had, and he was un, under intense stress. So it was a combination of things, and both of his parents had heart disease. So he was living under shadows of, of disease. Great question. I, I am, I'm trying to see if I can put this into words, my question, but as Dr. Jameson had said, Lowell was very difficult, I'm just reading this here, and, and it seems more, uh, what, what struck me about it is it's more a, a collection of impressions than it, than it does draw on a single visual descriptive kind of thing. So if it's a collection of impressions, I'm wondering if, in reading this, it will call to mind either ideas or images, and which of them will help better me to better understand the music? But you say they're tied together. Is it the images it con conjures or the If 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 the music um, if I've succeeded in any way in 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 writing what I hoped to write, if uh, then there, there's it, it would it's the experience should just there there you wouldn't you you hopefully won't need help help you won't have to ref, there shouldn't be anything referential that you have to do um, you know that that you know so when i say it's good to have those texts there you know it's it's sort of you know it's like having a passing glance you know read them you could read them all at once and not look at them again you could read it, it's just i'm usually i'm i'm antagonistic towards the idea of Reading and listening. I think listening requires, you know, all of our faculties, and any distraction is not a good thing. Um, uh, so, I guess my expectation would just be that if you listen to it and you had certain reactions and you read the the, the text, you might just kind of say, "Yeah," you would you would you would just sort of nod and 
sort of, um, there would be some sense that there was a rightness to it. Um, and, and if there wasn't, you know, Sorry. then that's, you know, then that, that, that can be expected too. I, but, but again, I just want to reiterate that I don't, I hope that, they, that the music doesn't need the poetry. I know that those texts don't need, need my music, that's for sure. I just think that the presence of those texts perhaps might heighten or augment the experience of listening to the music through their proximity, meaning just their, their being on the tip of your mind, you know, if you read, you know, that you might just recognize something of each in each in, in each in each in each pole, you know, the literary or the poetical and the music, that there's some common ground there. And um, and I think frankly, for people who don't have a lot of experience with with um, musical expression that's beyond, say, the standard repertoire, um, it provides a way in for some people. You know, that that if they're hearing sounds that they've not never not heard before that that you know, can be jarring. Um, and so the, the words can act as sort of a bridge, you know. And there's no, there's, I doubt that there's anybody who can read those texts and not have an informed feeling about it. Whereas the music, people might listen and say, I don't, you know, I'm not sure what that, I'm not hurt, you know, there's, everybody's experiences are so different with music, but our experience with language is pretty uniform. And, um, and our experience with music is uniform too, but, you know, but, Every composer is, you know, we're speaking in different languages, you know, and if you have no experience with a language, you know, it's probably not a bad idea to ground oneself into it a little bit. It doesn't mean you have to, that you have to end up liking it. Um, but yeah, but you can see I'm quite inarticulate about these relationships with, because, um, I don't know, I have never been asked before. Um, so, yeah, I, so I, it, it, it's, it's okay to read the, the text, though. It's you, okay you might to, say <laughs> that there is a, a certain dark thread that runs through the text. Yeah, I mean, I would say that the, I would, as I, I, I would say that the thread that I perceive through those texts, you know, that is shared with the music, certainly, you know, and and mainly what we're dealing with are issues of loss, grief, and you know, and their appending you know, tentacles. So yes, those are the sort of the broad strokes of of you know, expressive territory that that I that they share. Again, whether I, I succeed in in communicating that is certainly an open-ended question. But um, but from my standpoint, I was those are the things that I was trying to express, um, and it seems to me that Lowell was too. But I'm also well aware, though, that the context of a lot of those poems, if I if you read them in context. What you take away from those fragments would probably be unrecognizable. So that that's a whole other thing, which is a whole other um, issue, which you know, for another day about w whether it's even right for a person to to extract things like this, to take these things out of context. I imagine there are a lot of people that have a real problem with um, one artist, you know, uh, with a composer taking fragments of. Of, of a poem which was clearly intended to be re read in its, in its entirety. Um, <clears throat> but that's a well, risk on it, it, Probably Lowell would not be one of those because he yeah. actually was a great translator, depending on your perspective, but he, he got huge criticism. But right. he, he took poems in languages he, he didn't know, took texts from a different language to translate from, and then wrote his own poetry and yeah. warned. I mean, he saw language as living, and yeah, he saw yeah. language as you contributed to it. And he would be the first, I think, to say. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, that's good to know. Yes. yes. <laughs> and he and he actually re regarded uh, when Benjamin Britten wrote uh, music based on, on Lowell's work, and he said it was one of the greatest honors of his life. He liked the idea of being yeah, yeah. written from. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Michael, can you just say something about the interplay between the text and your composition? That is to say, I understand that you read, there's, there's uh, impressions that you take, there's parts of the poems that move you, and then that inspires composition, but are you composing, rereading, 
refining or ha just can you say something about your own creative process and, yeah, no, that's and the interplay between text and composition? Yeah, no, that's the part that's that is a bit it's sometimes a bit puzzling. It's actually it's I'll be writing and then the words come to mind. So something I do reminds me of something Lowell did in this case. And then that acts as an accelerant somehow, like it, it, it then it feeds then whatever it was that I was. So, so it's that's the part that's a little backwards, I think, than you know, maybe more expected circumstances where it is sort of you start with with the object and uh, the non-musical object that then inspires something in the composer. The composer then. So that's a la something like pictures in an exhibition of Mussorgsky. That's sort of the more basic idea, right? You've got, you know, he's capturing these these paintings and music. In this case, it the process comes from writing, and then some these text fragments popping in into mind. And if that happens, that's very meaningful to me because I mean I I wasn't you know I, there was I, there was no reason for me to be thinking about these at all. I, I went into writing this piece not thinking about. Low at all, but from the outset, somehow um, these 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 text fragments started to come to mind, and then I'd have to go back and find them, you know. And that's and I stay true to what occurred to me. That's why they're sort of you know they're they're what they exactly need to be for me, you know. And so um, sometimes I'll remove one word, you know. I won't. It's not you know. Um, but so it's an inter. It's 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 a back and forth in real time sort of. But once I've identified the, the text, then that is exciting, you know, and then there, then that feeds more, then I'm getting more from that. And then it might you know, sort of oscillate back and back and forth. Um, yeah. So it really is, it really is like having a it's exciting because it's having a, this living dialogue, you know, even, you know, he's not there. I'm not talking to him you know, I, I, through his work, you know, it really does feel um, very much like a collaboration, you know, in a strange way. Yeah. Um, Lowell was quite a reviser himself yes. and allowed images to coagulate, so to speak. Absolutely, yeah, and then came back. Yeah. Um, there is one thing in the program notes that's interesting. They mentioned quarter tones, and it seems like in the second movement, um, which also has the word purgatory in it, maybe even suggesting some sort of threshold. Is there anything, and is that the only place with quarter tones? And uh, although you're speaking in the music, would you want to say anything about that? Uh, yeah, no, the, that is one of the only places. I, I, um, there was no conscious one-to-one -one correspondence between the idea of, uh, of, of purgatory um, uh, but the quarter, t you know, where 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 things like the where they do appear, they're they're very infrequent in the piece, and they that's just you know to me I just think of the quarter tone. It's just another you know it's just another shade of harmony. So it's it doesn't have any specific meaning. Also, just for the record, um, purgatory. I just ended, I just did a set of songs dealing with a lot of text on purgatory with uh, texts of Pound and. And Dante, and it's just interesting. For whatever reason, when I was when I was younger, a number of the texts that I initially read uh, of Dante really pr presented purgatory in a you know in a, in a relatively beautiful and sort of tranquil, sort of at ease in an at ease light. That doesn't mean that there's not sort of darkness sort of sh hovering around these things. But it's interesting that in a lot of a lot of purgatory, a lot of the writing about it, it's not it's. It, the way we use it in sort of our common parlance is much more grim than, than at least in my reading of Dante or specific parts of it. Um, and so it's, it's a very, it's, but that, since you bring up that word, it's a very complicated word. I mean, for, for me, I mean, it has a lot, it's imbued with all kinds of um, complexities and, 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 and contradictions and anyway. But still, the quarter tones, just because that's what the harmony needed <laughs> in that spot. Anything else? No? 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 Thank you very much. Thank you.
This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.